The words are those of Christ himself. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with power and great glory. In a moment of time, perhaps the next moment of time, the greatest event in human history could occur. Doctors Jack and Rex Salavanapi are about to take you on a most important journey to explore the very real possibility of Christ's return this generation. Hello, friends. What a great title for this video because it is so encompassing talking about the return of the Lord, but connecting it with our generation. Christ returns. This generation? How wonderful to think that the Lord could return at any moment and take us home to heaven. And Jack is going to be giving us some wonderful, wonderful biblical reasons why we could very well be the generation that will not have to die the one that the Lord spoke about. And when the Lord laid something on Jack's heart, it usually happens in the middle of the night. And he's up about 4, 35 o'clock every single morning. And I'll never forget the day that he brought this one to my attention. Rick Sell, we've got to do a video on Christ Returns this generation. And Jack, I'm so happy we are. Oh, I'll tell you, I'm really worked up, Rexella, because my heart is burdened. I had a birth and I got four to 5,000 notes, letters, cards. And so many of the people said, our pastor never mentions this. So here's what God showed me at 5 a.m. this morning. I've often quoted 2 Timothy 4, verses 2 to 4, and then 2 Timothy 4, verse 8. I didn't combine them because I've not memorized chapters. I memorized 15,000 verses by subjects. But this morning, it really hit me. And my goal is to try to get this into the hands of hundreds, maybe even thousands of ministers to get them straight on this subject. This is going to be the most important video we've ever done because we need to help the pastors. Now, let me quote it as it is, and I've never done it this way before. 2 Timothy 4, verses 2 to 4, preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season, when they like it, when they don't like it. Reprove, rebuke, exhort, with all long suffering and doctrine, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but will heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. They'll want their ears to be tickled. And many shall turn away from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Now, what is this doctrine he wants preached? Right in the same chapter, verse 8, he's writing to Timothy, it's one letter. Listen to God's word. Henceforth there is later for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also who love his appearing. That's why Titus 2.13 says we are to be looking for that blessed hope, happy hope, and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Pastor, if you're not preaching it, you are robbing your people of one of the five crowns to lay at Jesus' feet in Revelation 4, verses 10 and 11. And if you tie this chapter together, 2 Timothy 4, verses 2 to 8, all one section, in context, you'll know that the doctrine you are to preach is the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And some of you have never preached a message on it. May God change your thinking. Oh, yes. Well, Jack referred to the fact that we receive so much mail in our office here, and we're so grateful for every single letter, every single card. And I have chosen just a few, three of them actually, that I wanted to share with you. I could read oh, hundreds that refer to what I'm going to say right now. This one is from Karen Pinrod, and she says, Dr. Van Impe, it's a blessing to listen to your program, and you are right. The pastors of today don't preach about the return of Christ. Thank God we have you to tell us. Thank you so much, Karen. And I love this one 
from Christina Markle, and she's 95. She said, I'm 95. And by the way, friends, we hear from little children that are only like five years old, all the way up to 95. And she says, and I'm planning on going up soon in the rapture. Amen. <laughs> that is beautiful. <laughs> Thank you so much. And then this is from a pastor. Reverend Jose Luis uh, Ramos, and this is what he says to Dr. Van Impe. He's a pastor in Puerto Rico and Florida. Dear Jack and Rick Sella, I'm convinced that Jesus may return for his church at any moment. Don't stop preaching the truth, even if you finish alone, like Noah. I will see you in heaven and soon. Thank you so much, Pastor. We truly, truly appreciate every single letter. And you know, Jack, I just want to say that in this day and age of terrorism and famine and so many things uh, that hurts our hearts, we should be happy that the Lord said, I'm coming again and I'm going to straighten it all out. We should be happy for that blessed hope. Well, and that's what the blessed hope is all about the joy of Christ coming. And we're going to miss the tribulation after the rapture and then return with Christ for the greatest time this world has ever seen under his rulership. But this dear minister from Puerto Rico said, don't give up and I won't because I am to earnestly contend for the faith which was once and for all delivered unto the saints, Jude verse 3. I'm going to begin by asking Jack some questions, but this is the preface to it. I'll never forget when we were talking with a, a beautiful Christian lady about the return of the Lord. And that's not unusual for Jack, as you well know. That's one of his favorite, favorite subjects from the Bible. And in response to what he had to say, she said, Oh, Dr. Van Impe, nobody can know when it's near. Nobody can know when he's coming back. Well, I've got some questions to ask Jack about that reference, about what she said. Why is it that so many Christians will say that? Nobody can know. No one really knows approximately when he's coming back, Jack. These people are one of the prophetical signs that Jesus is coming soon, and that's 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 3. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last day scoffers, saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since our fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were. They're like ostriches with their heads in the sand. We have 500 fulfilled verses right now about his return and we can know when it's near even at the door and that's Matthew 24 verse 33 but what's wrong with these people they're away from God they are mug wump Christians their mug is on one side of the fence and their wump is on the other you see we ought to rejoice about this message concerning the rapture and then seven years later is coming to earth why because it is a comforting hope, 1 Thessalonians 4.18. It is a blessed or happy hope, Titus 2.13 has already mentioned. But here is the rub. It's a purifying hope. If you're not living a holy life, you don't want Jesus to come. The Bible says in 1 Peter 1.16, Be holy, for I am holy. Hebrews 12.14, Without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. So when you're really looking, you're going to be living for him. First John 3, 2, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is, and every man that has this hope in him, in his return, purifies himself even as he is pure. But we're living in the last hours. And there are two churches, the Church of Philadelphia, chapter 3, verse 10 of the book of Revelation. And they're the ones who hear, come up hither, and they're caught up in the twinkling of an eye. Revelation 4, verse 1, and 1 Corinthians 15, 52. But the Laodicean church represents so many of these people in these churches today that don't have a real experience. He says in chapter 3, verses 15 to 17, I know your works, that you're neither cold nor hot. I would you were cold or hot. So then, because you're lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I'll spew you out of my mouth. That's the Greek word, M-A-O, 
That's gurgitation. I'm not going to use the rough term. God says, you make me puke. That's as far as I'll go. Why? Thou sayest, I'm rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. And he says, thou knowest not that you're poor, rich, and blind, miserable, and naked. That's the picture today. And you know, it really bothers the Lord Jesus. Listen to him in Matthew 16, verses 2 and 3. He's talking to the people of his day, and he said, you look into the heavens and you say, tomorrow's going to be a fair day because the sky is red. In the morning you say, it's going to be a foul day because the sky is red and lowering. He says, you hypocrites! You can discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of the times. Now he was talking to the people of his day who missed the signs about his first coming. There were over 100 in the Old Testament. Had they known their prophecies, they would have known who this Jesus was. He was to be born in Bethlehem, Micah 5, 2. Born of a virgin, Isaiah 7, 14. He was to die on a cross, Psalm 22, 16. He was to die for sinners, Isaiah 53, verses 4 to 7. He was to be resurrected from the dead, in Psalm 16, verses 9 and 10, and he's going to come again as the king, Psalm 2, verse 6. Had they known these things, a hundred different ones, and I've just given you a couple, they would have known who he was. And if you Christians were studying your Bible and studying prophecy, 10,385 verses, you would know that it's near even at the door, Matthew 24, 33. Jack, that is so good. I don't think I've ever heard anybody say that before. But this is nothing unusual. They didn't recognize the Lord because they weren't reading their Old Testaments. They didn't know this was the Son of God coming because they weren't reading the Old Testament. I think that has to do with where we are today, don't you? Because Jesus, as God, gave a lot of prophecies that would point to his second coming. And we're not reading it. We don't really care that much, maybe because of the way we're living. That's what Jack is pointing to. But uh, if we were reading and really wanting to know when the Lord was going to return, it's all there, isn't it? Oh. Jesus talked about yes, it. Yes, Rick, so, yes. And so how many signs, Jack, did you just say point to the return of the Lord? 10,385 verses covering 1,000 signs, 500 already fulfilled and 500 to be fulfilled after we're gone. Okay, Jack, as God, did he have a pre-existence? You know, we hear about the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Did he have the pre-existence? He was the second member of the Trinity. Rexella, Jesus existed eternally, just like the Father. Micah 5, verse 2 says, Thou Bethlehem Ephrathah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet shall he come forth out of thee whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting, who is to be ruler in Israel someday. But he was from everlasting. Uh, the Lord Jesus helped his father create this world, as we're going to see in a few minutes from now. In Proverbs 30, verse 4, it says, Who hath established all the ends of the earth? What is God's name? What is his son's name? I got you. He had a son long before he was born of that virgin in Isaiah 7, 14, and Matthew 1, 23, centuries later. You see, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit sat down and discussed everything that was to happen. Jesus was foreordained before the foundation of the world, 1 Peter 1, 20. He's the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world, Revelation 13, 8. This plan was there because there was a trinity and Christ was part of that trinity. And you know, Many people today in the cults will take Deuteronomy 6, verse 4. Ha, ah, there's only one, the Father. Jesus is inferior. Wait a minute. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Now, let me give that to you in the Hebrew. Hear, O Israel, Yahweh, that's the Father's name, our Elohim is one Yahweh. Oh, I got you now. Why? Elohim is always a plural, more than one. In the beginning, Elohim created heaven and earth, Genesis 1.1. Now, what does Elohim mean? Come on, I prove everything. Exodus 20, verse 3. Thou shall have no Elohim before me. Thou shall have no gods before me. 
a plurality, more than one. Hear, O Israel, Yahweh, our Elohim, more than one, is one God. The three are one. I and my Father are one, along with the Holy Spirit, Jesus of Zed. All right, very, very important, though. When Jesus came to earth, did he lose his deity? Did he not know all things? How about it, Jack? You know, some people are a little bit confused about that. They think because he became human, took on a form of a human, he lost his deity, did he? The one who came to earth is called the God-man. Remember that. But he always existed. John 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the Word. Now, let's go to verse 14 there. The Word was made flesh. Who of the Trinity took on himself flesh? The incarnation, Christ. So, let's put Christ in place of the Word. In the beginning was Christ, and Christ was with God, and Christ was God, the second member of the Trinity. Acts 16, 31, Paul and Silas said to the Philippian jailer, after he asked, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Verse 34, they believe in God, Jesus, with all their house. Romans 9, verse 5, Christ came who is overall God, blessed forever. 1 Timothy 3, 16, great is the mystery of Godliness that God was manifest in the flesh. Now, this is the Father speaking to his own Son. If the Father doesn't know, then something's wrong. You called us, have it all confused. Listen to what the Father says to Jesus. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. That's good enough for me. Regardless of what any man might say, let God be true and every man a liar, Romans 3, 4. 1 John 5, 20, we have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. And God has three major attributes. Now I'm gonna use theological terms omniscience. He knows all things about all things. Omnipotence. He is all-powerful. Omnipresence. He is everywhere at all times. Now, I have studied the best. I have over 100,000 hours of study in the Word of God. If you were to sit down today and begin studying the Bible 24 hours a day without eating or sleeping, it would come to 11 solid years. I have read the works of St. Augustine and his series of writings on the city of God. I've read John Calvin's Institutes of the Christian Religion. He, of course, was the one who propagated five-point Calvinism. I've read the works of Martin Luther, the works of Spurgeon, the works of Wesley's, both brothers, the leaders of Methodism. And then in commentaries, I've read Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown. And these are men who cover every verse of the Bible from cover to cover. Also, the Liberty Commentary, Matthew Henry's Commentary, the Pulpit Commentary, the Wycliffe Bible Commentary, and just in case you wonder how far I've gone, I have the Encyclopedia Judaica, which carries all the history of the Jewish people, and Vincent's Greek word studies. There are many, many more, but I do know what I'm talking about, and you're going to be shocked with some of the things you hear as I disprove some of the men I've just quoted. All right, I'm going to back up just a little bit. He referred just a moment ago to the fact that Jesus being pre-existent as God, was the one who created the worlds. Is that correct, Jack? He created the universe. Oh, very definitely, uh, Rexella. John 1, 3. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. That's this one called the Word in John 1, 1, and that's Christ. Verse 10 says, he was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. Colossians 1, 16, For by Christ were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible. No doubt about it. And when we get to Hebrews 1, verse 2, it talks about Christ, and it says, By whom God made the worlds. And one day, you and I are going to stand before Jesus and 
crowns are going to be passed out, five different ones, and we're going to lay them at Jesus' feet and listen to what is being said as they're laid there in Revelation 4, verses 10 and 11. Verse 10 states, The four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne, that's Lord Jesus, and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Now let me explain that. Twelve patriarchs of the Old Testament representing all saved Israelites and twelve apostles of the New Testament representing us believers. Twelve and twelve, twenty-four, they're casting their crowns before him. There are five different crowns, as I've said, one for looking for his return. And here's what they say. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory, honor, and praise and power, for thou hast created all things. And I'll tell you, I look forward to that day when perhaps we can lay crowns at his feet, Rexella. Amen. That's our prayer. Well, friends, uh, Jack referred to the fact that Jesus was preexistent. He's the one who created all things as part of the Trinity. Well, he not only knew about the first coming that he would have as he came as a babe in Bethlehem's manger, he planned it. When he was on earth, he also knew when he'd be coming back. They planned it. He knew every detail that would happen just prior to his return because he was God. Jack, I love that. The Lord planned it. He gave us uh, all the evidences that we need today. Oh, Rixella, this lady you talked about at the beginning said, Oh, even Jesus didn't know. Mark 13, 32. Now, wait a minute. Dr. Albert Barnes, one of the greatest theologians ever, said this scripture portion that says not even the sun is not in the original Greek manuscript. Somehow it got slipped into some of the English versions. But let's go back to Matthew 24, verse 33. Jesus, speaking to all of us, said, you will know when it's near, even at the door. In fact, the Greek imperative there is, I command you to know when it's near, even at the door. Now, if we know when it's near, even at the door, surely he must know something. But then he adds in verse 36, and don't ever take these two verses individually. Put them together in context. You'll know when it's near, but not the day and the hour, verse 36. Now, I'm proclaiming that the return of Christ to the earth is near even at the door. And that's why we're promoting this particular video, Christ's return, this generation, I believe we are the generation that's going to be alive for the appearing of Jesus very, very soon. But we don't know the day and the hour. But Jesus predicted the signs, how we could know. If he gave the signs of how we could know, certainly these are signs he knew that would be happening just about when he's ready to return. Where are they found? Matthew chapter 24, Mark chapter 13, and Luke chapters 17 and 21. Let's just take Matthew 24 for a minute. He said in verse 3, when they said to him, what shall be the sign of thy coming in the end of the age? He answered, there shall be false Christ and false prophets. Verses 5, 11, and 24. There shall be wars and rumors of wars. Verses 6 and 7, famines, Pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places, diversified areas. Verse 7, he said there shall be a great anti-Semitic move in the world. Verse 9, verse 12, iniquity shall abound. We have never seen more filth in our life than what's going on right now in the entire world. In verse 14, he says the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached to all the world. Now, that's not yet the 144,000 of Revelation 7 verses 4 to 8 are going to be the messengers that preach the gospel of the kingdom. Today we preach the gospel of grace. But they're going to say the king is coming. The king is coming because that's the message. Do you know I was shocked the other days I studied a book that said Christ remained behind for 40 days, Acts 1-3, so he could tell them about his coming kingdom. And this literally stunned me. He only mentioned his church three times in the four Gospels. He mentioned his coming kingdom 129 times. I guess we're going to be preaching it very soon. Now, Rexel and I are on in all the world, 
And we have started to declare this message already, not only the rapture, but that which happens seven years later when we return with the King of Kings and Lord of Lords to set up His glorious kingdom. And believe me, every one of these signs point to that. In verse 15 of Matthew 24, he talks about the abomination of desolation. That's when the Antichrist sits in a temple in Jerusalem, 2 Thessalonians 2, 4. And a false prophet of Revelation 13, 15 declares him to be God. And because they put up his image in the temple, it causes the temple to become an abomination in God's eyes. So it's called the abomination of desolation in the book of Daniel. And of course, Jesus mentioned it here in verse 15. He says, when you see this abomination of desolation, you know it's real near. When you see it, flee because of the horrendous tribulation era that's about to appear. He talks about that tribulation in verse 21. For then shall be great tribulation such as never was since the beginning of the world to this time, nor nor ever shall be. Except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, the Jews here at that time, the days will be shortened. There's just so much here. He talks about signs in the sun, moon, and space, verse 29, and then the terrorism that inundates the world in verse 37 and compares it with Noah's day when the world was filled with violence, Genesis 6, verse 11. Now, if Jesus said these things are going to be there, plus everything you read in Mark 13, Luke 17 and 21, he certainly knew the signs. Uh, we know the signs. And why did he give us the signs? So you'd know it's near, even at the door. I command it. A little bit later. I am going to be bringing to your attention, and Jack's going to back it up with the Word of God, uh, many, many more signs that are so relevant to your life. Oh, my, things that are going on right now, you can really put into your home almost because it's very relevant to you, and Jesus knew that these things would happen. But I got good news. There is an awakening you know, a lot of preachers are beginning to wake up and they're beginning to say, you know, the Lord is coming. There are so many signs. We can't overlook this. We've got to be preaching about it. I'll never forget when we were first married, Jack pulled out a magazine called Herald of His Coming. And it was the first time I'd ever seen that magazine. And it was all about the coming of the Lord. And uh, there was an article just recently in that magazine that really blessed our hearts. Take a look. The bridegroom soon to come, very soon, the Lord is coming. That's exactly what this article is all about. And you know, Jack, I'm so happy that many ministers now are waking up in many denominations and starting. I kind of say thank you to you. I think that through our TV program and your efforts, a lot of men have uh, been awakened. Oh, we're going to deal with that in a few minutes from now, Rexella. All right. Well, when you think about the return of the Lord, does it bring joy or does it bring fear? Take a look at this. The rapture, loved or feared? Look at those faces. They're all looking up, but different expressions on their faces. Once again, the rapture exposed. Now, this is an article by a pastor, Jake Young, and he's talking about a book and it is a very, very interesting book. But she says, and it is Barbara Rossing who wrote the book, The Rapture is a Racket. And going on here, the idea of rapture is a deception. Dr. Thinkpin has written this book, The Rapture Trap. Louis Cassells, he is a top theologian. You can count on it. Every few years, some scholar will stir up a short-lived sensation by publishing a book that says something outlandish about Jesus. The scholar usually has no standing as a Bible student, theologian, archaeologist, or anything else related to serious religious study. But that need not hold him back. If he has a job, any job, on a university faculty, his findings will be treated respectfully in the press as a scholarly work. Whoa, that is very significant. And another great prophetic book, The Rapture to Catholic View of the Latter Days and the Second Coming by John Tumblr and Hubert Funk. And they dedicated this to their old scripture professor, Bishop John J. Dougherty, who first unveiled for us the mysteries of the prophetic 
word. Now, they also gave great credit to that wonderful, wonderful uh, Protestant teacher from Dallas Theological Seminary. And I have to give him credit for what he did in my life, too, Dr. Dwight Pentecost. Oh, and Dr. Wolverd. Oh, great, great Bible teacher. And uh, Dr. Uh, Pentecost wrote things to come. That affected them very, very much, Jack. Yes, it really and did. And now they're all beginning to talk about the coming of the Lord. Well, I want to start with Barbara Russing, who is a Lutheran minister. And I'm going to tell you, 1 Thessalonians 4.13 says, Paul speaking, I would not have you to be ignorant brethren. Well, we got an ignorant sister here as well. I mean, she knows nothing what she's talking about. Louis Cassells was right. Uh, here are people who've never studied prophecy, hundreds of hours, like I have, 100,000 hours, but they have all the answers, and they're promoted. Listen to me. First of all, I wonder if she's ever read or heard about the works of Martin Luther. He did two books, verse by verse, on Daniel in 1524 and 1544. They've never been translated from German into English. However, Dr. James Montgomery Boyce and Dr. John Walvert document some of the things that Martin Luther taught. And they said when he came to Daniel 11.36, where this one magnifies himself above every God, and 2 Thessalonians 2.4, who exalts himself above all that is called God, it is talking about the infamous Antichrist who should come 1 John 2.18. No bones about it. He taught a tribulation period. And then they went on to say that Martin Luther in Daniel chapter 2 spelled out all of the different kingdoms that would come. And of course the first two, Assyria and Egypt, were already passe when Daniel stands before Nebuchadnezzar and mentions the final ones as Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece and Rome, and Luther said the final world power when Christ comes will be Rome. And of course, that's the revived Roman Empire, the European Union. But you know, on television not long ago, I said Lutherans are amillennialists because someone had sent me a copy of their constitution. And it said, we do not believe in the thousand year reign of Christ. And when I said it on the air, I had a minister write to me who is a Lutheran, and he said, many of us Lutherans have left the synod, have left the big body, because they did not teach what we believed. They would not believe in a rapture. They would not believe in the seven-year period of tribulation. They would not believe in the millennium. And anyone who doesn't believe in the thousand-year reign of Christ is called an amillennialist. Now, I want to read this letter to you. Boy, it just gave me goose pimples on my duck bumps. Reverend Sam Guido, presiding bishop of the Lutheran Orthodox Church. And he tells me there are three different Lutheran groups now, all preaching the same message that Dr. Van Impey preaches, and they use his materials. He says, as the bishop, when I go to speak to all these ministers, I tell them to tune into your program, to listen to you, because you are right. Now, here is his letter. Dear Dr. Van Impey, we wish first to thank you and your wife for your wonderful and exciting ministry. Yours is the only program that I insist as a family we watch every week. I am a Lutheran pastor, and it's true that many, especially the larger synods, do not subscribe to the rapture and to the millennium, but there are many other Lutheran ministers who do. I preach the rapture. We have returned to the original writings of Martin Luther, there are three organizations of Lutheran pastors who teach and preach about the rapture. I often quote you in my sermons or make reference to something I've heard on your program. I, as the bishop, am often recommending to my congregations and the ministers wherever I speak that they watch your program. We truly respect you, listen to you, and support you. But please don't lump all Lutheran pastors together because some of us in the three Lutheran groups actually know the scriptures. Amen. May the Lord continue to bless you, Rexella, and your ministry. Thank you, Reverend Sam Guido. 
Now, let's talk about the Presbyterians, for most of them are amillennial. There'll be no rapture. There'll be no tribulation. There'll be no millennium. God forgive these men. Dr. Donald Gray Barnhouse, the great Presbyterian church in Philadelphia, preached all these truths. And he was in trouble sometimes with the heads, and he finally had to leave the major synod. But let's go just a little further. This Jake Young was quoting Barbara Russing in making fun of the rapture idea. Are there Presbyterians? Yes, many of them as ministers who do preach this and believe it. How do I know? I went to the Detroit Bible College, and you know that the founder of that school was the minister of Central Presbyterian Church and taught the rapture because he was a graduate of Dallas Theological Seminary, but still pastor of a Presbyterian church and Ward Memorial Presbyterian and Knox Presbyterian Church where I preach for these men. All Presbyterian leaders preach the truth. Just because there are a few Presbyterians who have never studied the subject like Louis Cassell says doesn't mean it's not true. Great Presbyterian leaders preach this subject. I could name some who didn't, and they're now with the Lord, but I'm going to leave that alone right now because they wrote some nasty letters about my preaching on the rapture and the millennium. And before I get through, you're going to see how ridiculous their arguments are. And then the Christian Reform Movement doesn't believe in it. But listen to me. Do you know that Dr. John Walford was one of these ministers in the group that says there's no millennium and then the Lord showed him the light and he became the great prophetical scholar, scores of books. Came out of the Presbyterian background, was a Presbyterian minister. I was shocked when I read this about him. He agreed with what the Christian Reformed Church was teaching at that time, but he changed. And I have a man who's listened to us for over 10 years and now he's written a book saying exactly what I'm going to say in a few minutes from now and has sent it to many of the clergymen of the Christian Reform Movement, showing them that they'd better think this through once again. And the Catholic Church, I've got some exciting things about the millennium later that I'll read from their own catechism. But Fathers Tumblr and Thunk, I read their entire book, describe the rapture in all of its glory, how we're going to be caught up. Not only that, but the traditional Catholic Church, which is attempting now to go back to Latin, and Pope Benedict XVI is promoting the idea of using Latin again in the service, wrote to me, and his name was Father Gomer de Paul from New Jersey. He said, I'm a traditionalist, and we use the Latin. And he said, I love what Jerome had to say in the Latin Vulgate the year 400 on 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, where it talks about being caught up. And he said the Latin word is rapiamor, raptured, hallelujah. So I love what Fathers Tumblr and Funk have said and what Father Gomer de Paul has said. And we're going to say a lot more about this as we get to the Catholic Catechism just a little later. All right, Jack, there are so many books being written about the return of the Lord, some we've just made reference to, but the book that we can really trust and know is true is the book that God wrote, the Holy Bible. And I just want to say, friends, that if a book you read contradicts the Bible, don't believe it. Believe the Bible because that's the book that God wrote wrote. We can trust that book. And so I'm going to ask Jack, are there many scriptures in the Bible that refer to the rapture? And uh, are there quite a few in there, Jack? Oh, a number of them are excellent. It's exciting. Genesis 5, 24, Enoch walked with God and he was not for God took him. Now, what does that mean, took him? Hebrews 11, 5, Enoch was translated so that he should not See, death. He was taken up without dying. That's a picture of the rapture for those who are going to be alive when Jesus calls his church home. Then in 2 Kings 2.11, angels and chariots of fire came after Elijah and he was caught up by a whirlwind into heaven without dying. How about Jesus after he was resurrected? Acts 1.9, when he had spoken these things while they beheld, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. 
our rapture. Then in Revelation chapter 7, we have one of the greatest revivals in history. And millions are being killed for the Lord Jesus. These are the martyred saints of Revelation 20, verse 4. I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus. But at that time, when they are persecuting these people and taking their lives, revival is sweeping the world. And Revelation 7, 9 says, I saw a multitude which no man could number. Gigantic. And what's happening to them? Verse 14, these are they which have come out of the great tribulation, have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. But what about these martyrs? The next verse. They're gone. They're up. And they stand before the throne of God. A rapture. Then in Revelation chapter 11, we have the two witnesses who are preaching during the period called the tribulation hour. Seven years of it. And they are hated for their message. And they kill them and they're lying in the streets for three and a half days. And suddenly there's a voice from heaven, get this now, saying, come up hither. The same thing we're going to hear in Revelation 4, verse 1, and they sweep into the heavenlies to meet Jesus. Now, these are instances where raptures occurred, but the definitive teaching on this was given to the Apostle Paul after his conversion, as we're going to see in a couple of minutes from now. Ah, oh, right when I was a little girl, while Jack was speaking there, I couldn't help but think about it. In Sunday school, I heard that word, rapture. <laughs> they said that Jesus was raptured, away. What's so hard to believe about a rapture? I believe Jesus was taken away and that the instances that Jack just gave happened in the Bible. Rapture, they were taken. Jack, describe the rapture, will you please? Okay. Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, states in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16-18, The Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Wait, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them, with the dead, in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. 1 Corinthians fifteen fifty one. Here's Paul again. Now, this is interesting. I show you a mystery. Now, most of us think about something on television where someone is killed and they're trying to solve it. A mystery in the Bible is something that has been taught for the first time. The rapture cannot be found even in the four Gospels as a teaching. Although there were some raptures that have occurred, but they were not given a title or defined. But listen to this. I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, all be dead. But we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we, the living, shall be changed. For this corruptible, the dead, must put on incorruption. This mortal, the living, must put on immortality. My friend, that's the rapture and it's going to happen soon. And when it happens, we are changed to be like Jesus on the way up. The psalmist said in Psalm 17, verse 15, I shall be satisfied when I awaken with thy likeness. Philippians 3, 21, Who shall change our decrepit bodies that they may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. 1 John 3, verse 2, When we see Jesus, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. When you look in the mirror, don't give up. There's a better day coming. Forget your plastic surgery. Wait for the coming of the Lord. He says, come up, and you're not only going to get a new face, you're going to get a new body. And you know, I like this little story, Rick Sella. It's my favorite joke. And it's about the little Amish man and his son. And you know, they don't believe in electricity, have no cars, nothing that's modern. They don't even uh, have televisions, anything in their house. They have to use coal stoves because nothing that works with electricity will they have. <laughs> so he said, son, let's go out today and explore the world. I said, okay, Dad. So they're in their little cart and buggy, and suddenly they see this great mall. And he says, what's that, Dad? He said, I don't know, son. Let's go in and look. So they walked in there and looked around 
And they saw these doors banging open and shut. And he says, what's that, Dad? He said, I don't know. It says, elevator. Well, let's watch for a while. And along comes a little 85-year-old lady, all bent over, crinkly, wrinkled skin. She gets into the elevator. The door slams shut. And he says, Dad, she's gone. Hey, look, it's going up, up, up. Dad, look, now it's coming down, down, down. Doors swing open and out steps a beautiful 21-year-old blonde. And the old Amishman said, son, go home and get mama. (laughs) (laughs) But that's a picture of the rapture. We're going up and we're going to be changed in the twinkling of an eye to be like the Lord Jesus. And you know, I don't understand how all these Christian churches have a creed that believes in the resurrection of the dead. John 5, 28 and many other places. Believe it? Yes, we're going to be raised from the dead. Okay, but what happens to the living at that time? They don't have an answer. The only answer is the rapture. First the dead, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them, with the dead in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Oh, it's going to happen soon. We are the generation, I believe, that's going to see Jesus coming to earth seven years after the rapture. But we're going to go home very soon. So the bodies of my parents are in the grave right now, but their spirit is with the Lord in the rapture. The Lord will unite the spirit with a resurrected body, right? Rexella, let me explain that. Go back to 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 14. It says, when Christ comes to get the dead who rise first, he brings those that are asleep, those who are dead with him. Oh, my first contradiction in the Bible. No, there are no contradictions. How could he bring the dead with him in verse 14 to get the dead in verse 16? Simple. As soon as one dies, his spirit leaves the body to be with the Lord. As the body without the spirit is dead, James 2.26. To die is gain, Philippians 1.21. doesn't lie around smoldering in a grave. The body does, but the spirit goes home to be with the Lord. That's why 2 Corinthians 5.8 says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And that's the spirit that leaves. Now he brings those that sleep with him, the spirits that have been there. They come after their bodies. They're having a great time. They don't need bodies over there. God's a spirit, John 4, 24. The Holy Spirit is a spirit, John 16, 12. Christ was a spirit, but he took a body so he could die for us on the cross, Philippians 2, verses 5 to 8. The angels are all spirits, Hebrews 1, 14. And all our loved ones over there are spirits, but they're coming back to get their bodies. Why? Because they're going to reign with Christ for a thousand years, Revelation 20, verse 4, and you can't do that very well as a spirit. There'll be millions on earth over whom they reign, and they've got to be able to see the person. And that's why they come back for their bodies. The Bible doesn't leave anything unanswered, right, Sella? Resurrection, a new body. I'm looking forward to that, <laughs> aren't you? And uh, we're going to be like the Lord. Oh, how wonderful. Well, where did the teaching of the rapture start? It started with the Bible. Jack just gave us all those scriptures. But the people who oppose the teaching of the rapture, when Jesus in the clouds say, come up hither, How wonderful to hear those words, come up hither. I'm taking you out of this miserable world. It's wonderful to go up to be with him. Well, they say that it started with John Darby in 1830. A lot of people say that, Jack, and you want to oppose that, don't you? Yeah, and a retarded girl. You know, I get so tired of these people who think they know something about prophecy. And remember, I have read... 11,000 volumes in my life and probably three or 4,000 of them are in Bible prophecy. And you talk about a minister being guilty of plagiarism. They all copy one another. They all take the argument that John Darby in 1830 started this teaching and the Schofield Bible promoted it. Wait a minute. What's the truth? And I pray that if some of you have preached the other, you'll get your heart right with God. This teaching started with 
the Lord Jesus Christ in John 14, 3 and John 11, verses 25 and 26, but not thoroughly explained like Paul explained it. Do you know that Papia, one of the church fathers in the first century, said that his closest friend was the Apostle John, who wrote the Gospel of John, the three epistles of John, and the book of Revelation. And Papia said, John told me that all the apostles believed in the rapture and the millennium. Okay? The shepherd of Hermas preached it in 150. Victorinus, the bishop of Bateau, delivered it and proclaimed it in 270. In 350, Ephraim the Syrian, who wrote many of the great hymns for the Orthodox churches, told about the rapture. In the year 400, Jerome wrote the Latin Vulgate and is already mentioned when he got the First Thessalonians 4.16 where it says, caught up, he put the word in there, or a piamor, raptured. Then the Dark Ages came, a thousand years of it. Very little Bible teaching came into being. All these great doctrines were put down. Nothing was said. And after the thousand years, the light started again. In 1304, Reverend Dulcino preached on the glorious rapture. In 1400, all these new Bible translations, and we're going to use some of them in a few moments from now, came into existence, all proclaiming the rapture. In 1555, Hugh Latimer. I'll just give names now. In 1620, Joseph Mead. In 1640, we had Increase or Cotton Mather. In 1697, Peter Jodot. In 1700, we had John Askill. In 1744, Morgan Edwards. In 1748, we had John Gill. In 1763, James McKnight. And then in 1792, Thomas Scott. And after all of these, we had Darby in 1830. Don't tell me that Darby started this thing. That is the biggest lie that's ever been proclaimed. And all of you are copying one another's books and saying the same thing. God forgive you. All right. Now, take a look at this question. Will you please? Isn't the pre-trib a rapture a recent view? Now we're going to talk about the fact that the tribulation happens after we go up. How wonderful. And then of course there's Morgan Edwards and the pre-tribulation rapture teaching 1788. And I want to recommend this book right now. Jack Van Impey, The Great Escape Preparing for the Rapture. The next event on God's prophetic clock. A wonderful work there, Jack. 220 and, pages. Yes, it is. And you know, it is so wonderful to know that we're going to hear those words, come up hither. And after we are up, the tribulation happens, Armageddon happens, all that. It's wonderful to know that we'll mm -hmm. escape that, Jack. Amen. Uh, Jeremiah 30, verse 7. Alas, for that day is great. There's none like it. And it's the time of Jacob's trouble. Who is Jacob? Second King 1734 finds Jacob changing his name to Israel. So it's the time of judgment for Israel, for the Jewish people. The church is already evacuated and gone. Not only that, but the Bible teaches in Luke 21:36. That we are to be ready at all times. So he says, watch you therefore, that you may be counted worthy to escape. Escape all these things that shall come to pass on the earth. How do we escape it? Revelation 3.10. He's talking to believers. Because you have kept the word of my patience, I will keep you from the hour of temptation, the hour of testing, which shall come upon the whole world. Now the Greek word there is ek. E K out of. If he wanted us to go through it and teach that to us, he would have said dia, D I A. But he didn't say you're going dia through it, you're going to be evacuated, ek, out of. And oh, that's a glorious thought. In 1 Thessalonians 1 10, he says, We wait for his son from heaven who delivered us from the wrath to come. And then again in 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, 
For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's deliverance from the wrath of Revelation chapter 16, verse 1, which takes place during the seven-year period of tribulation. And the seven years is unfolded in Revelation chapters 6 to 18. You say, how do you know it's seven years? Well, because... In Daniel 9, 27, it talks about a peace program, and it's going to be the final Shabua of Daniel 9, 24. And a Shabua is seven years, Hebrew, seven years, Greek, heptad. Revelation 11, verse 3, and chapter 12, verse 6, tells us that one half of the tribulation hour is 1,260 days. You double that, you've got 2,520 days. Now, that is a Jewish year of 360 days, not like 365 as we have. So it's going to be 2,520 days when all these things are happening. Praise the Lord, we're not going to be here. My book, The Great Escape, gives reason after reason why we won't be here. But one of the great arguments is found in 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 6 and 7. He says, the mystery of iniquity, that's the coming of Antichrist, doth already work. Only he who now hinders this Antichrist from coming to power will continue to hinder until he be removed, and then shall that wicked one be revealed. Notice he can't come to power until the hinderer is removed. People say, oh, that's the Holy Spirit. No, it isn't. The Holy Spirit is omnipresent in Psalm 139. Read it. That means he's present everywhere at all times. He cannot be removed from the earth. He's in heaven. He's in the earth. He's in the sea. And the Bible says he's even visiting in hell. Imagine. Well, then who is removed? Those in whom he lives. Our bodies are the temples of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 3.16 and 1 Corinthians 6.19. We're removed. And then shall that wicked one be revealed. And you know, this is interesting. Rachel is going to do something now that will knock your socks off. She's going to read all of the Bible translations of the past. And every one of them, where we have falling away in our Bible, they have departure, a rapture, removed, ek, out of. Tell us about it. All right. Well, these are the first seven translations in the English language. And uh, I do want you to read it with me, if you will. The first seven English translations of apostasia all rendered the noun as either departure or departing. They are as follows. Wycliffe Bible, 1384. The Tyndale Bible, 1526. Cloverdale Bible, 1535. The Cramner Bible, 1539. Breach's Bible, 1576. The Beza Bible, 1583. Geneva Bible, 1608. And that was before that great King James translation in 1611. You know, that is uh, pretty compelling to me that those translations said apostasia rendered that noun departure. We leave. Or, yeah, or departing. Huh? And That's, then the wicked one is revealed. Amen. Hey, men, we're not going to be here. And the tribulation hour is just months probably ahead of us, the way the world situation is right now. Now, uh, friends, we're going to be leaving the subject of the rapture, the departure, the going up when Jesus says, come up hither. We're going to go into the second coming, the literal second coming of Jesus to the earth. How many times have you heard me say on our show that Jesus is coming back to stop everything, stop Armageddon? Jack, explain the difference between the rapture and the second coming of Jesus to the earth. Well, first of all, the rapture is a meeting in the air, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 to 17. And the second coming is his return to the earth, Zechariah 14, 4. And that's where men like Pat Robertson of the 700 Club get it all wrong. He teaches that we Christians talk about three comings. No, we do not. Since he came the first time to earth, he must come to earth a second time. The rapture is not his coming to earth. It's a meeting in the heavens. 
and then seven years later we come back with Christ to earth. Now the difference is the rapture takes place before the seven year period of tribulation. The seven years is mentioned in Revelation chapters 6 to 18. Where are we gone? Chapter 4 verse 1. Come up hither. The rapture. Rapiamor according to the Latin Vulgate. Then after the rapture, chapter 19, Christ returns with his army in verse 14. And that's his second coming. And that's why Jude verse 14 says, The Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. They had no way of saying millions, billions, trillions, quadrillions in Bible time. So they said tens of thousands and innumerable hosts. So the rapture is an event that takes place before the seven year period of tribulation occurs. And then at the end of it, Christ comes back with his bride for the thousand year honeymoon on earth. Two different things, the meeting in the air and his coming to the earth. And the coming to the earth is a second coming because it had to be like the first coming to earth, to terra firma. Now, Jack, it really wasn't hard for Mary to accept what the angel Gabriel said to her. He said that your son will sit on the throne of his father, David. Not only was Jesus the wonderful Savior of the world, but he was going to sit on the throne of his father, David. Didn't happen when he was here the first time. So the second coming is when he will sit on the throne of his father, David. Now, the reason I said it wasn't hard for Mary to accept, because the Old Testament rabbis uh, accepted the fact that they would have a Messiah. Take a look at what Rabbi Eliezer had to say. Messiah's day shall be 1,000 years, for it is written, a day in God's sight is a 1,000 years. And Rabbi Jose agrees when he underlines the message of Rabbi Eliezer by adding that Messiah's days are the days of restitution for Israel and are 1,000 years. Now, the Lord was not on the earth a 1,000 years, but he's going to be. And that's when he comes back to earth, right? Sure. He's to be ruler in Israel, Micah 5, verse 2. The one born in Bethlehem. It didn't happen. It's going to happen. Now, do you know that Dr. Edersheim, in his book about the Messiah's coming, said that there are 456 Bible texts that Messiah will come and reign for a thousand years. And the rabbis in their writings dealt with another 558 times for a total of 1,014 documented texts that Messiah would come and reign for that 1,000 years. And they also taught the six-day theory. Now, how did they come to this 1,000 years? They said that the world was created in six days, Genesis 131, and God rested on the seventh day, Genesis 2-2. And each day represented 1,000 years, Psalm 90, verse 4. So they said from the creation of Adam until Messiah comes will be 6,000 years. Six days of 1,000 years of peace. And guess what, folks? We have just entered the seventh day. There's confusion in some of the calendars, but this is the hour, and this is why we believe that we are the generation that's going to see the return of Christ to earth to set up his glorious kingdom. We just entered the seventh day. Now, 6,000 years from Adam until now, correct, Jack? We just entered the seventh day. Dr. Nathaniel West had something really important to say about the thousand-year reign of Christ in that seventh day. He says this, When he comes in the clouds, he doesn't leave. He's coming here to rule and reign for 1,000 years. Such is the Jewish origin of our Christian faith, the faith of the early Jewish Christian church, the faith of the pre-Christian rabbis, the faith of God's people under the old covenant, the faith of the prophets, the millennial faith, and the millennial kingdom of glory on earth, the prelude of eternal blessedness. Now, you know, friends, he's really a genius, I think. In he fact, Rexella yes. took two verses and wrote an entire book on two verses proving what he just said there. All right, Jack. What other church fathers taught this along with him? Well, first of all, let me say that uh, Reverend Peters in the Theocratic 
government of Christ on earth said that in the 19th century, there were 360 of the greatest theological minds and giants who proclaimed this 6,000 year theory and that he would reign for the thousand years on the seventh day. And oh, it has arrived, ladies and gentlemen. I don't know how much longer we're gonna wait, but soon he's gonna break through the clouds for the rapture and seven years later we return with him. But do you know that Gibbon who wrote the decline and fall of the Roman Empire said there were 21 major church fathers for 400 years who taught that Christ would come on the seventh day. And it was only changed in 431 by a certain culprit I'll mention in a few minutes from now. But who taught it in the first century? There was St. Barnabas, St. Bartholomew. Second century, St. Arrhenius, St. Justin Martyr. Third century, St. Lactinius and St. Methodius. And in the second century, Arrhenius and Justin Martyr said, and they were dogmatic, if you don't believe in this thousand year reign of Christ, don't even call yourself a Christian. Now, I'm not gonna be that hard. But I'll tell you, that's how important it was to them. And that went on, I say, until 431, 430 years of preaching the thousand year reign of Christ on earth. And how did the church fathers for over 400 years document this scripturally? Second Peter, the third chapter, beginning with verse three, knowing this first that there shall come in the last day scoffers saying, where is the promise of his coming? Eh, nothing's changed. Since our far forefathers fell asleep, all things remain as they were. As I said earlier, get your head out of the sand, you ostrich. <laughs> but they said, wait a minute, though they're going to be scoffers, verse 10 says, the day of the Lord will come. And then the magic formula, verse 8. A day is with the Lord like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like eight days, just like the rabbis taught. And it will go on for six days, 6,000 years, and the seventh day Christ will come for the thousand years of rest, blessing, and peace. You know, the Jews, the Jews were looking for their Messiah. And uh, they're still looking for their Messiah. They're going to accept a, an Antichrist uh, that will set up a seven-year peace contract there in the Middle East later on. But they're looking for their Messiah way back when Christ was here. So, but what caused the message of Christ's return to the earth to be shelved? You know, if we as a church, what caused some churches to shelve it and even do away with it? Take a look at this. How anti-Semitism, remember I said the Jews were looking for their Messiah, corrupted the church. Anti-Semitism. Again, the roots of replacement theology. And there you see it in accurate assumptions and also misunderstood scriptures, misunderstood history. And lamplighter, anti-Semitism, its roots and perseverance. Where the Christian left is wrong. What is the relationship between Israel and the church? I'm going to ask Jack uh, that, of course. Was it replacement theology that caused the return of Christ, the theology when he would come back to earth to be shelved because of anti-Semitism? There you got it. Inaccurate assumptions, misunderstood scriptures, and misunderstood history. Was that it, Jack? That wasn't the cause. No, the cause was what you said first, anti-Semitism. Right. There was an individual in the early church named Origen. Pope John Paul II, in his book, Crossing the Threshold of Hope, said he was one of the heretics of the faith because he taught universalism. Everybody would be saved, no one would be lost, and therefore there was no such thing in the Bible as hell, though it's mentioned many times. Well, that was quite a comment from the previous pope. But Origen hated Jews, and his friend Ambrose sided in with him. And they persuaded St. Augustine, believe it or not, a guy with a saintly label, to also turn against the Jews. And they said, let's get this corruption about a Jewish Messiah coming for a thousand years out of the Christian faith. Let's do away with it. And they were successful. In 431 at the Council of Ephesus, 
They did away with the thousand-year reign for the end of the world. Predictions. And you know, when I say oftentimes on TV, Jesus is coming soon, Van Ippie is accused of being a doomsday preacher, preaching if the world's going to end. No, we who are looking for the rapture and looking for the millennium are not doomsday preachers. It's the other crowd I mentioned, the Presbyterians, the uh, Christian reformers, the Lutherans, many of the Catholics who are the doomsday preachers because Augustine's started this thing. When Jesus comes, the world's going to blow up. He did not believe that this world could go on forever, regardless of what the Bible said, as we're going to see in a few moments. Well, then these Protestant groups, when they broke away from Catholicism, uh, took the air with them. The end of the world is coming. It's not coming, as we're going to see in a few moments. 120 verses in this book say it's a world without end, as they have 45, 17 in Ephesians 3.21. Well, the problem had started, but how were they going to satisfy the minds of Christians who had believed in the thousand-year reign? They're, go they're going to teach replacement theology. They said, from now on, forget it. God is through with Israel forever. And lo and behold, every time the word Israel appears, just make it the church. 2,604 times. Every time Jerusalem appears, call it heaven. It's 813 times. 3,417 times they manipulated this holy book. And if you're in these denominations and your preacher isn't preaching it, like many are from these denominations that I showed earlier, you'd better do something about it. How can you honorably feel at home in churches that have taken this book 3,417 times and twisted it around? You can't do it, ladies and gentlemen. The word of the Lord endures forever. And holy men have got spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit, Second Peter 1.20. We better believe what is written and what the fathers taught for 430 years. You can't change history just because of Jewish hatred. God forgive us. Mm. Do you know who agreed with that, Jack? I was quite surprised uh, when this was brought to my attention. A poet and novelist, Robert Louis Stevenson, is uh, almost saying what Jack just said. Take a look. I cannot understand how you theologians and preachers can apply to the church scripture promises which in their plain meaning apply to God's chosen people Israel and which consequently must be future. The prophetic books are full of teachings which, if they are interpreted literally, would be inspiring and a magnificent assurance of a great and glorious future, but which as they are spiritualized become farcical or laughable. As applied to the church, they are a comedy. Can you imagine a poet and a wonderful novelist writing exactly what you're saying, Jack? It's almost laughable. It is laughable. Why? Take Ezekiel chapters 38 and 39 where Russia marches against Israel. Israel is the battleground mentioned 18 times there. Every time it says Israel, put in the church. For instance, they come from the north and Russia is north of Israel. From the north against Israel, from the north against the church, that doesn't make any sense. Uh, look at Romans eleven twenty six. All Israel shall be saved. Let's put their interpretation there. All the church shall be saved. You can't get into the church, Acts 2, 41, 2, 47, unless you are already saved. You can't make this work 2,604 times. And especially Philippians 3.3, 3, where all the Israelites' men are to be circumcised. I mean, we've got 2 billion Christians on earth now. That means 1 billion Christians would have to get circumcised soon. The Jewish people practice circumcision. You can't put the church in these places. It is laughable. He's right. Oh, remember what I just said about Gabriel when he was speaking to Mary that her son would sit on the throne of his father, David. That means that he would be a king. Not only savior, but a king. Take a look. This book, The King is Coming, H.L. Wilmington, and it sold over 200,000 copies. The king is coming. Now, did Jesus say that he was not only the savior of the world, but did he also say that he would come back? Seven, they put above the cross, Jesus of Nazareth, 
the king of the Jews. He came to be the king. I said this earlier, I want to repeat it. Jesus only mentioned the church three times in the four Gospels. He mentioned his coming kingdom 129 times. Now, why? When a man wrote to me and said, why did Jesus hang around for an extra 40 days after his resurrection? I looked it up in my computer Bible, and the only text I could find is Acts 1, verse 3. He spake about his kingdom, the day he would revive here on earth as the King of kings and Lord of lords of Revelation 19, verse 16. This is scriptural. In Psalm 2, verse 6, Yahweh God says, I'll set my king upon the holy hill of Zion, of Jerusalem. When Jesus comes back, he sets his foot upon the Mount of Olives, which is just in front of Jerusalem in the east. No doubt about it. God says in Zechariah 2, verse 10, Sing and rejoice, O daughters of Jerusalem, for lo, I will come and dwell in the midst of you. And then again in Zechariah 9, 9, O oh, daughters of Jerusalem, rejoice! Why? Your king is coming to you. Well, when he hits the Mount of Olives in Zechariah 14, 4, and 24, verse 3, chapter 28, verse 20, and Hebrews 9, 26, six times it talks about the end of the world. Yeah, but it's a mistranslation. The Greek there is aeon and does not mean world. It means the age. There are seven dispensations. We are now in the sixth one, the age of grace. And then when that comes to an end, and that's what the end there means in Matthew 24, 3, we go into the age of the millennium, the seventh day. Now, let's prove that. Matthew 24, 3, what shall be the sign of your coming and of the end of the world? It can't be. Why? Turn the page. Chapter 25, verse 31, he comes in his glory with all his holy angels and he sits upon the throne of his father. That's that throne of David mentioned already in Luke chapter 1, verses 32 and 33. So you see, it can't be the end. Of, you can't have the world end in chapter 24, verse 3 and have Christ come back in chapter 25, 31 and say to those here on earth, Come, inherit the kingdom, the thousand-year kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. So forget this end of the world stuff there. Now, there are 120 texts. I'm just going to give you a few of them, all right? When Christ comes, he first of all rules for 1,000 years, Revelation 20, verse 4. But when he's recommissioned, 1 Corinthians 15, 24 to 28, his kingdom continues forever and forever. Watch this, Revelation eleven fifteen. The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our God and his Christ, and he shall reign forever and forever and forever. <laughs> That's pretty plain, isn't it? In Daniel 2, verse 44, it talks about the rise of the European Union, the revived Roman Empire. And it says, in the days of these kings, and we see them now, right now, united in Europe, Brussels, lasting kingdom. Oh, I love Daniel 7, 18. He says, the saints take control or possession of the kingdom, and it lasts forever. And then adds, even forever and ever and ever. Four times in one verse, he says, it's eternal. I believe it. How about you? Oh, there are just so many texts. Uh, for instance, Isaiah 9, verses 6 and 7. Unto us a child is born, virgin birth. Unto us a son is given. That's when he returns. Why? Because the government's on his shoulder. Can you find him ruling the government when he came the first time for 33 years? No. But he's coming back, and the government's going to be on his shoulder. And the next verse says, And of the increase of of peace and his government, there shall be no end. As I said earlier, he reigns over the house of Jacob forever and forever and forever. Luke 132, and Jacob is Israel, 2 Kings 1734. And Rexella, if his kingdom lasts forever, then the world can't end. That's why Ecclesiastes 1 verse 4 says, the earth abides forever. If God's throne is set up on earth forever, then the earth has to be here forever. Or those promises could not be fulfilled. 
when God says, thy throne, O God, speaking to his son, is forever and forever. He meant it. But there has to be an earth that's here forever. Now, Psalm 104, verse 5. Yahweh, God created the earth. It shall never be removed, never be destroyed. Plain, isn't it? What did Jesus say in Matthew 5, 5? The meek shall inherit the earth. Not heaven. They're coming back and they're going to inherit the earth. Terra firma. For how long? Psalm 37, 29. The meek and the righteous inherit the earth forever. That's why Isaiah 45, 17 and Ephesians 3, 21 both say that it's a world without end. And isn't it strange that St. Augustine started this malarkey? And many of the Catholics are teaching it today. And yet every Catholic mass ends with world without end. Amen and amen. Hey, you can't have it both ways. And I accept this book. The world is going on forever. I'm going to show you something out of the Catholic catechism soon that doesn't agree with what St. Augustine started teaching. And you know what? Oh, boy. If only the priest would begin digging into their catechism, this new edition by Cardinal Ratzinger, who became Pope Benedict XVI. Read it. You'll be shocked. We'll give it to you in a minute. Ooh, Jack has just given us a lot of verses, hasn't he? And, you know, I'm afraid that I uh, have to be a little more simplistic in my own mind. So I have one verse, and if you can only remember one verse, remember this one. Ecclesiastes 1, 4. The earth abides forever, Jack. That's enough for me. The Bible says it, and I believe it. The earth abides forever. Well, there's 6,000 years from Adam until now. We are going into the 7,000th year, which will be the reign of Christ on earth. And then we have an eighth day. Eighth day. All that's right. That's the new heavens and the new earth. New earth. That's right. Well, let's take a look at some other references. And I want to refer to Barnabas. He's the one who traveled with the Apostle Paul. Remember? The first epistle of Barnabas. This is what he had to say. When resting from all things, I shall begin the eighth day. The eighth day, the beginning of the other world. Now, that other world is the new heavens and the new earth spoken of by Peter. Well, he very well knew Peter because he talked to him many, many times also. Then there is another gentleman, Dr. Arnold Fruchtenbaum writes, and this is what he has to say. The millennium itself is only 1,000 years long. However, according to the promises of the Davidic covenant, now remember, Jesus is going to sit on the throne of his father, David, the Davidic covenant. There is an eternal destiny, the eighth day, an eternal kingdom, an eternal throne, an eternal earth for the eternal order. You know who else agreed with everything that he had to say? That was Dr. Dwight Pentecost, Dr. Jennings, Dr. Scott, Dr. Kelly, and Dr. Ryrie. How wonderful to know that there's going to be an eternal kingdom for our Lord, Jack. The eighth day. That's Isaiah 66, 22. Uh, the new heavens and the new earth. Now, there are a lot of people that think that this world will be blown up and then this will be a new creation. Absolutely not. In Revelation 21, 5, he says, I will make all things new. Now, get that. He didn't say, I will make all new things. The things that are here, he will make new, remodel. There are two words in the Greek, neos and kainos. Neos always means a new creation. Kainos always means a remodeling job. When it talks about the new heavens and the new earth, it is always the term canis, the remodeling job, the renovation. And it's the renovating of this old world. It's changed. Now, that's like our conversion. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. We're still the same old people, but there's been a change. It's uh, like what happens at the rapture. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, be dead, but we shall all be changed. We get our new glorified bodies. We're still the same person remodeled. Amen. So watch it. This is exciting. The new heavens, the new earth. Hebrews 1.12, the heavens shall be changed. A remodeling job. Now, I have in my possession here the Roman Catholic Catechism. I've read it through twice, 2,800 points. My, I'll tell you, 
I got blessed when I read about the return of Jesus Christ. Now, if you folks have a catechism at home, write down these points and look it up for yourself. This tells the entire story. It does not agree with the end of the world like St. Augustine taught. The priest should start proclaiming their own catechism and doing away with the nonsense of the end of the world. Now, let me give you the point. 840, the coming of the Messiah. 2816, the kingdom of God is ahead of us. In Christ, we shall reign. Again, 2817, the petition is Maranatha, the cry of the spirit and bride, meaning come Lord Jesus. Indeed, as soon as possible, Lord, may your kingdom come. 2018. 818. In the Lord's Prayer, thy kingdom come refers primarily to the final coming of the reign of Christ through Christ's return. You can't miss it, can you? 2,853. The Spirit in the church pray, come Lord Jesus, since His coming will deliver us from the evil one. And that's when Christ comes and destroys the Antichrist in 2 Thessalonians 2.8. Point 769. The church longs for the full coming of the kingdom, when she shall be united with her king. 1042, the universe itself will be renewed, not recreated. Hallelujah. Come on, St. Augustine, get on with it. You probably are with the Lord now and have found out the truth. All right. 1047, the visible universe then is itself destined to be transformed, changed, restored to the original state. This is exactly what I've been teaching you today. Point 765. This is not anti-Semitic. The 12 tribes of Israel are the foundation stones of the new Jerusalem. That's the holy city of Revelation 21 and 22. But don't miss this one. Point 349. Come on now. The eighth day begins the new creation. Hey, if you got an eighth day, you better have a seventh day. And the seventh day is the thousand year reign of Christ. Thank you. This is good. All right. Well, I'm going to go to some uh, global headlines, some global pictures in just a moment. But did you know how many signs there are that point to the return of Jesus to the earth? About 500. So we have jotted down just a few of those. We're going to go back and forth here. Yes, Can I Jack? say a word? Yes. Every sign points to his coming to the earth. There are no signs for the rapture. If nothing were fulfilled, we could still go home and everything could be fulfilled in the next seven years. But there are 500 signs already fulfilled pointing to his coming to the earth. So you know how close it must be for us. Beloved, we are the generation that's going to live to see Christ's return. This is it this generation. All right, we're going to talk about that in, in depth in just yeah, a yeah. moment, Jack. We're going to go back and forth here, friends, and uh, see if the things I mentioned quickly are in the Bible. Really, really quickly here. Airplanes. Isaiah 31, 5. Horseless carriages or automobiles. Uh, Nahum chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. The desert of Israel blossoming as a rose. Isaiah 35, 1. The alignment of the ten nations or the European Union. That's uh, a uh, Daniel chapter 7, verses 7, 8, 20, 24, Revelation 12, 3, Revelation 13, 1. Knowledge will be increased. Knowledge explosion. Daniel 12, verse 4. False Christ and false prophets. Matthew 24, verses 5, 11, and 24. Wars and rumors of wars. Matthew 24, verses 6 and 7. Something that breaks my heart. Famines. Revelation chapter 6, verses 5 and 6. Earthquakes in many places. Oh, that's Luke 21, 11. Pestilences. Also Luke 21, 11. Iniquity. Oh, such iniquity abounding. Matthew 24, 12. Signs in the sun, moon, and stars. Luke 21, 25. Terrorism. Matthew 24, 37. Oh, my drugs. Oh, that's uh, Revelation 18, 23 and Revelation 9, 21. The atom bomb in the Bible. That's 2 Peter 3, verses 10 to 12. And of course, Psalm 97, 3, Isaiah 66, 15, Revelation 8, 7, Revelation 9, 18. It's all there. And these are the signs that tell us he's coming back to earth soon. But seven years preceding that, we're going home to see him. 
All right, and then the last one here that we have written down, scoffers, people who would laugh oh, about it. Oh, we've been it. dealing with that. Uh, the scoffers shall come. And all these Christians say, say oh, it's never going to happen in my lifetime. Even Jesus didn't know. Come on, get with it. Rewind this thing and listen again. All right, we're going to zero in now and elaborate on some of the things that we just mentioned. The first one being the European Union. When did it start? When did it start? Well, there was a visionary, and you see his picture right there, Jean Monnet, and he was the architect for the European Union. Here you see again the European ideal, the signing of the Treaty of Rome. Very, very important. And again, the EU should expand beyond Europe. Now, this is spoken by the Foreign Secretary of the European Union. The EU must improve military capabilities, the UK says. Now, as you well know, the European Union has expanded to 27 countries, and they're going to keep expanding. In fact, they're going to be the power, aren't they, Jack, eventually? The Bible teaches in Revelation 17, verse 10, there will only be seven world empires, and the final one would be the revived Roman Empire or the European Union. It's here. I said it a minute ago. You find it in Revelation 12, 3, Revelation 13, 1, and Revelation 17, verses 3, 7, 12, and 16. All of these state that there would be 10 nations. It started with Benelux in 1940. 48 and rose to 10 nations by 1981 and then it would go to 13 and that happened in 1995 when Austria joined and that was Daniel 7 verses uh, 8 and 24 and then lo and behold ladies and gentlemen it would become global for this Antichrist shall devour the whole world, Daniel 7, 23, and will have power over all kindreds, tongues, people, and nation, Revelation 13, 1, and they want to build their armies up. And this is shocking. Read Revelation 19, 19, for it's this European Union and its armies who try to prevent Christ from setting up his kingdom because this Antichrist is the one who has said I am God, Second Thessalonians 2, 4. We don't need you, Jesus. It's here, Rexel. It comes out of the European yes, Union, yes, doesn't it? Yes, yes, yes. Daniel 9, 26. The European Union could not even be organized until there was an Israel. That's when all the signs began to form, friends. Until Israel was a nation, none of the signs meant anything. That's the date on which we put our signs. Just in right? case we run out of time, Rexel, the seven signs... There had to be a revived Roman Empire, the European Union. There had to be the mark of the beast or talk of it, 666. There had to be an Israel. The Israelites had to capture Jerusalem. And then there had to be a Russia who would march against Israel in Jerusalem. There had to be a tremendous power called China. And then there had to be a nation that would talk about the annihilation of Israel. Iran's doing that now. These are the seven that tell us we are the generation that will probably live to see Christ coming. Let's well, keep I'm going. I'm going to elaborate on the, yeah. what you just mentioned yeah. a moment ago. Who's making the decisions for the European Union? Not the people. No, no, not the people. Take a look. There you see them. The decision makers, the EU representatives have a history of just going right ahead and making decisions. They met in Portugal in 2007 and made some decisions. Take a look at the next one. EU ignores public, expands powers. A European Union summit brought out a number of critics complaining about this institution's threat to democracy. Is it too little? too late. All right, we all know. Be he God or the devil. All right, who said that? That was Paul Henry Spock, and we all know he was the prime minister of Belgium and one of the key founders of today's European Union. This is what he had to say. We do not want another committee. We have too many already. What we want is a man of significant stature to hold the allegiance of all people, that's very significant, all people, and to lift us out of this economic morass in which we're sinking. Send us such a man and be he God or the devil. We will receive him. And that is very, very, very important. Wow. 
Again, on the cover of the week, someone's watching. Now, how is this man going to keep track of the world? The brave new world of public surveillance. Big Brother is tracking you. Microchip implants viewed as the end of prophecy in the U.S. Microchips implanted in humans, modern marvel, or is it Big Brother? The Augusta Chronicle. They've got your number, a student identification number, that is. The program will be tracking pupils. It's going everywhere. And supercomputer will equal 100,000 P. Sees. You know, Let me add it, honey. Are, but, Jack, they're not going to have trouble keeping track of everybody with that kind of uh, no. surveillance. No. First of all, he comes out of the European Union, this one called the Antichrist, Daniel 9, 26. Was Spock right when he said, be he God or the devil will receive him? Well, when he comes to power, he'll claim to be God. Daniel 11:36, and he will oppose and exalt himself above all that is called God, so that he, as God, sits in the temple of God, showing himself as God, 2 Thessalonians 2, 4. But he is controlled by the devil, the dragon, and that's Revelation 13, verse 4, and the dragon is Satan, Revelation 20, verse 2. And he has a religious cohort that helps him administer the mark of the Antichrist, 666. And you find that in Revelation 13, verses 16 to 18. He calls it all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in the right hand or forehead that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that understanding count the number of the beast, for it's a number of man. In his number is 603 score and six. Will they be able to keep track? Is it going to hinder our privacy? Yes, very much so. And you know how they'll do it through computers. Oh, I wish I could get into this more extensively. I need another hour and another video. <laughs> but right now, they say in 10 years from now, we're going to have computers that do 1,000 trillion calculations per second, get thousands of pieces of information on all 6 billion, 700 million of us per second. Think of it. One thousand trillion calculations we're living in the last days all right jack we mentioned a moment ago about israel becoming a nation i want you to take a look 60th birthday plan to bring israelis home is launched now they not only want them to come and celebrate they'd really like the israelis to come back and live again hamas urges united nations to rescind decision that made Israel a state. They want to do away with the state of Israel. And again, the Saudis say no to Jewish state. 20 years after they became a nation, they took Jerusalem. Happy 40th birthday, Jerusalem. Very important date. Israel to ready public for all-out war. I can't believe that. Take a look at that. All-out war. Perez warns one morning, will wake to a nuclear in Iran. Israelis warn to stay alert. Israel designs mobile bomb shelters. Now, Israel has designed and developed the world's first mobile bomb shelter in an effort to protect themselves against the Palestinian missile strikes from Gaza. Now, why have we in mentioned Israel so often? Because everything in prophecy hinges on 1948 and 1967 when they took Jerusalem. Is that right, Right Jack? on, honey, right. right on. The Bible teaches in Luke 21, verse 32, Jesus speaking, that the two signs that trigger the whole thing for Christ's return is when Israel becomes a nation, Matthew 24, verse 32, and the Jews captured Jerusalem, Luke 21, verse 24. There was no Israel for 2,534 years because in 586 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar took the Jews captive to Babylon. And it was only May 14, 1948, after 2,534 years, I'm repeating it, they became a nation. And that's Ezekiel 36, 24. I'll take you from the Gentiles, gather you out of all countries and bring you into your own land. They're there from over 100 nations now. And then, them bones, them bones. Remember that song in Ezekiel 37, verse 11? The bones are the whole house of Israel, verse 11. What happens to them? He said, I'll open your graves, the nations of the world, 
bring you up out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. Verse 14, I will plant them in their own land. It's happened in our lifetime. The Jews capturing Jerusalem, the Sixth Day War, June 5th through 10th, 1967. That's Luke 21, 24. I repeat, and the Jews were not in control of Jerusalem for 2,554 years. It's all here, ladies and gentlemen. And Zechariah 12 says that Jerusalem would become a burdensome stone. That's what's happening. In all the fuss that's going on, soon they're going to divide Jerusalem. And Joel 3, verse 2 tells us that that's what begins World War III. Mm, World War III. Talk about global headlines, friends. Wow. A moment ago, Jack mentioned the importance of Russia in the prophetic calendar. Well, you know, Russia will play a very important part in the signs pointing to the return of the Lord. And with Putin now becoming the prime minister instead of the president, does that mean that he will lose his power in Russia? Well, Putin makes it clear that he will stay in power. 2012. Yes, Putin's victory leads to talk of permanent rule. Putin goes ballistic. Russia warns of new arms race in outer space. And Putin's people, the spies who run Russia. Putin says Chinese-Russian relations to remain strong. That is a very, very important prophecy right there. China's military buildup spurs concerns. Sharp rise in China's military spending, the largest increase in five years, follows criticism from the United States. From Jane's Intelligence Digest, China threatens U.S. satellites. U.S. plans new space weapons against China. Take a look at North Korea and the defiance, and there you see their huge army. Uh, there, They are defying what we would want them to do. Now, it's very, very important that Russia and China stay together, isn't it, Rick Jack? Sella, Putin says he's putting in one of his lesser men so that he can come back in 2012. They are releasing the old men within the military of China and replacing them with new blood by 2012. That's the prediction of Nostradamus. But wait a minute. The Bible teaches that Russia and China are going to unite for the War of Wars, but they're going to come down to the Middle East at separate times. First, there'll be Russia. Ezekiel 38 and 39 are the titles of God, Magog, Meshach, Tubal and Rosh, or Russia. And that's the battle of the latter years and the latter days, Ezekiel 38, verses 8 and 16. They come from the north against Israel, Ezekiel 38, verses 15 and 16. And they have formed now what is called the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, the Russians and Chinese working together. When Russia is pushed back to Siberia, Joel 2.20, the next move, the second phase of Armageddon is when China comes, the kings of the sun rising. And that's Revelation 16.12. And that's why we showed the article about North Korea. It'll be many of the Orientals for the largest army in the world. For if you study Revelation 9, verses 14 to 18, the number of the army is 200,000, 200 million. Impossible. The CIA says there are that many already prepared for warfare in China. 1 billion, 200 million people. And of that 200 million, ready. Not all in the army, but already trained. So there you have it. That's going to happen. There had to be a powerful Russia and a powerful China, and they would invade Israel. Israel didn't exist until our generation. It's all ready to go now, so you can see why we believe we are that generation. Mm, Vladimir Putin made a very, very strong announcement. He said that he was going to continue the flow of arms to the Middle East. Now, you know, that's going to put a little bit of a strain on the United States and Russia, I believe. But take a look. Putin continues to arm the Mideast. Russia bolsters tie with Iran. Now, there is somebody else. Very, very important, Iran. And you see them together, common cause, trying to isolate strong men sometimes brings them closer together. Iran unveils weapons deal with Russia. Russia and Iran harden against the West. That's us, friends. Iran may have nuke in three years. Syria acquiring Russian rockets at furious pace. Iran says Israel and the United States will soon die. And Netanyahu 
Oh my, oh my, who is a great, great prime minister of Israel says this. He gives the United States five years at the most. And exactly what did he mean by that? So very, very important, Jack. What did he mean oh, by five years? World War, and that takes us to 2012, like we said in a recent video. Now listen to me, ladies and gentlemen. There had to be an Israel. And this is the seventh and final sign proving we're the generation. Why? The last thing that a federation joining Russia and China does, and this is the Arab Federation, mentioned in Daniel 11:40, Isaiah 17, 1, Ezekiel 38, verses 5 to 7, and Psalm 83, verses 5 to 7, 20, 25 Arab nations united together for one thing. Now watch it. This is the last sign. Psalm 83, 4. Let us cast Israel off from being a nation that their name be no more in remembrance. Annihilation, extermination of Israel. Not have the nation again. It's not going to work. For the Lord's coming back, setting his feet upon the Mount of Olives, and he's going to put a stop to those who are destroying the earth and destroying one another. Revelation 11:18. Iran's not going to secede, nor is Russia, nor is China. The Lord Jesus is going to come and stop it all and set up his kingdom. But isn't that amazing? It is. They couldn't say, let us wipe Israel from off the face of the map, Psalm 83, verse 4. There was no Israel till our day. I repeat it. 2,534 years without such a place called Israel. It's here, ladies and gentlemen. Now do you see why we believe we are the generation that's going to live to see Christ return. In the light of everything that we've given you today, such proof from the Bible, such proof from current events that are going on right now, if the Lord should come, would you be ready? It's so soon and we need to be living for Him. Jack, once again, could you show us how to be ready? Oh, Rexella. First Peter 2.24, speaking about Christ says, who his own self bear our sin in his own body on a tree, on a cross. He died for every one of us. And you know what this book promises in Titus 1.2? The guarantee of eternal life to whosoever will believe in him. I'm asking you to pray the prayer right now. I'm going to go slowly. Lord Jesus, God in human flesh, the God who created the world with the Father and the Spirit. You came and took a body to shed your precious blood for me, to cleanse me, to save me, to prepare me to be with you forever. Soon in heaven and then on earth forever forever. Lord Jesus, I want to trust in you this day as my own Savior. I'm asking you to come into my heart and save me this very minute. I believe you've done it, and I thank you, Jesus. Pray all these things in your beautiful holy name. Amen. Amen. Oh, friends, I trust that you pray that prayer if you did not have the Lord in your life. And I guarantee that when the Lord comes in, He'll forgive you of anything and everything. There are some things that we mentioned today, like drugs that would be in the world. And you know, we have so many people, not only who are hooked on drugs, but there are other things in their lives. Maybe there's something going through your mind right now. The Lord can't forgive me. Yes, that's why He came, to forgive you, to make you ready for heaven. And I trust that you trusted him to do that today, to be your savior. If you did, please write to me. I'll send you absolutely free this little book at First Steps in a New Direction. The Lord wants to walk with you in a new direction. And you know if you belong to the Lord, you're going to long to see him. You look forward to being with him. Let me leave you with this thought I always do on our programs each week. Serving the Lord is an investment that pays eternal dividends. Oh, how good to serve Him in these days. We'll look forward to being in your home again this next week on our television program. And until then, 
Remember, the Lord loves you. God cares for you. So do we so very, very much. Bye-bye.